We're continuing our studies in Chapter 11 on carbohydrates, and in this lesson we'll be looking at reducing sugars. Reducing sugars are carbohydrates that can reduce oxidizing agents. In other words, they function as reducing agents. Remember the definition for reducing agent. It's an agent that reduces something else while itself being oxidized. In order to do so, these sugars must carry a reactive carbonyl group, a group capable of being oxidized. These sugars, remember, can alternate between a closed and an open chain or linear form, and it's the linear form that carries that free carbonyl group. Let's look at the example here of glucose, and that's illustrated at the bottom of the slide. In the closed form on the far left, we have the cyclic structure of glucose, but remember there's a dynamic equilibrium between that ring structure and the open or linear form in the center. It's in the linear form that we have that reactive carbonyl group in the form of an aldehyde group. What is the measure for whether or not it is a reducing sugar? It is a reducing sugar if it can reduce Benedict's reagent which is an alkaline solution of copper sulfate. So in this case, glucose is our reducing agent, and again it's that linear form carrying that reactive carbonyl group that is the reactive form. It reduces copper 2 to copper 1, and is itself oxidized from an aldehyde to carboxyl group. So this is the definition of a reducing sugar. Can it reduce Benedict's reagent? We'll find as we consider more details concerning metabolism that many sugars are derivatized or modified, sometimes in the course of a metabolic reaction and sometimes permanently derivatized for their functions. So let's look at some examples of how sugars can be derivatized. In this example, and we have the diagram at the bottom of the slide here, glucose is reacted with methanol and that yields a glucoside. That methoxy group can add at either the alpha or beta position, and so we get a mixture of an alpha glucoside and a beta glucoside. You'll notice that methoxy group has been added at that number one carbon position. That's our anomeric carbon. Once we react it in this way, that ring structure can no longer open. We no longer have that reactive carbonyl group, and so now it is a non-reducing sugar. In this case, the bond connecting that methoxy group to glucose is referred to as a glycosidic bond. A glycoside is a sugar linked to any other molecule or group. So this is a, a glucoside, specifically an example of a glycoside, and that bond is a glycosidic bond, which is a bond connecting a sugar to any other molecule. Another way that sugars can be derivatized is by being phosphorylated, and we have an example on the bottom left of the slide. Glyceraldehyde can be phosphorylated on the number 3 position, and fructose can be phosphorylated at the number 6 position. You'll notice in each case we phosphorylated a carbon other than the anomeric carbon, so these would still be reducing sugars. These are important intermediates in metabolic pathways, as are many phosphorylated sugars. Another example of sugar derivatization is on the bottom right, where a hydroxyl group of glucose has been replaced with an amine group to form glucose amine. You'll notice in this case also it's carbon number 2 that's been modified, not carbon 1, so glucosamine would also be a reducing sugar. Yet another way that sugars can be modified are by oxidizing the sugar at an end other than the anomeric carbon, and that's illustrated at the top of the slide in glucuronic acid. You can see we've oxidized that terminal carbon, and to form glucuronic acid, we still have that reactive carbonyl at the number one position. Next, we have xylitol on the lower right. This is a case where the sugar has been reduced to an alcohol. You'll notice this takes place at that anomeric carbon, and so this is not a reducing sugar. A very important way in which sugars can be modified are to convert ribose, and that's the bottom left, to deoxyribose on the right. 
this is a process of reduction as it is important in producing the nucleotides needed for both RNA and DNA. A good example of a non-reducing disaccharide is sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide composed of glucose and fructose. Let's see where the bond is that's connecting these two sugars. First on the left, circled in blue, we have the anomeric carbon, carbon number one on glucose, and that's forming a glycosidic bond with carbon number two of fructose, highlighted by the red circle. Each of these, carbon number one on glucose and carbon number two on fructose, are anomeric carbons. These are both occupied in forming that glycosidic bond, and therefore this is a non-reducing sugar. Neither of these ring structures can open, and therefore they cannot reduce Benedict's reagent. In our next video lesson, we'll look at how polymers of saccharides are formed and how this allows them to be stored as fuel.